Okay, this is the 10th lecture in the molecular diagnostics module, um, looking at the use of a technique called hybrid capture, which is specifically used in the UK to detect human papillomavirus, which is a causative agent in cervical cancer. So what we're going to look at is how hybrid capture can be used to streamline the cytology screening process so that only the most high risk cases are looked at and the low risk cases are not then brought in for unnecessary follow-up treatments. So these are the key points that we're going to cover. Uh, I'll give you an overview of the relationship between cervical cancer and human papillomavirus in that most cervical cancers contain this virus but only specific types. Uh, we'll go over current cervical screening, uh, the current cervical screening program, what it's looking for and how it's trying to identify as many cancer cases um, but with not a particularly high positive predictive value. So we screen a lot of people, get a lot of false positives who then come back for follow-up treatment that might be unnecessary. And we think that molecular methods can improve upon this. So we're going to look at the molecular methods, focusing on hybrid capture, but we'll also mention allele-specific PCR. Um, and we'll see how this intervention of doing molecular testing before cytology works uh, to reduce the number of people who have unnecessary follow-up appointments. So HPV, commonest uh, STD in the UK, is probably, I think I'm right in saying this, still the most lethal uh, STD in the UK. More people will die from HPV infected cells causing cervical cancer than will die of HIV in the UK. So it's a big problem. The key thing is there's lots of virus types out there, some of which cause warts, genital warts. Other types cause non-genital warts like verrucas and normal warts on your hands. Then other types, this group, uh, are the highly oncogenic types uh, and the genome of these viral types are what are found in the vast majority of cancers. Now we have a screening program to detect for, hit for cervical cancer and what we're now starting to do is look for the virus itself rather than look for cancerous cells and then if the virus is present then maybe look for abnormal cells. We have a vaccination program at the moment. There's two different viruses that have been used in the UK recently, uh, Svirex and Gardasil. Uh, this one, uh, Svirex, may be better for protecting against cervical cancer. Gardasil seems to be better at protecting against some of the high risk strains, but also good at preventing at some, some of the low risk strains that cause uh, genital warts. But we know that these types very rarely go on to form cancer. So HPV is a common STD, but positivity certainly doesn't mean the patient's going to get cancer. Uh, even if you've got a high risk type, it doesn't mean you'll go on and develop cancer because a large number of lesions are resolved by the immune system. And as we'll see later, there's a crucial step that is required for the formation of cancer, and that's abnormal integration of the viral genome into the host cell genome. Um, some people are just better at getting rid of HPV infections than others and if you have a long chronic drawn out infection then you're more likely to get the HPV virus abnormally and accidentally integrated into your own cells permanently and that seems to be a key step in developing cancer. Um, it's fair to say that the vast majority of uh, squamous cell carcinomas of the cervix contain HPV DNA. There are some adenocarcinomas that maybe don't. There may be other uh, cancers that are not HPV caused, but the overwhelming majority of cervical cancers will have an HPV uh, cause to them. So currently we have cytology screening. So cytology is different to histology. Cytology is just looking at cells that have been scraped off the cervix. Histology is a full depth tissue biopsy. So for screening purposes, what we want to see is what cells are on the surface of the cervix. If they're abnormal, we'll then go on and do histopathology and do a biopsy. Um, 
the current screening is the PAP stain, and the PAP doesn't stand for papilloma, it stands for Papa Nicolau stain, and that will stain up the cells in a particular way, so you can see the cytoplasm, see the nucleus shape, and we're expecting to see large flat squamous cells, which I'll show you in a moment. Now, the, you could argue that if there is no virus, there is no point looking for abnormal cells because they will not be there and that's why molecular tests have been brought in as a pre-screen prior to doing cytology because we can rack through hundreds of samples an hour on a almost ELISA-like system but it's not an ELISA uh, to detect the viral DNA in a cervical swab. So if we detect viral DNA then it's worth going on and doing cytology but only if it's high risk uh, viral DNA. So this is what cervical cytology looks like. We have got in A we've got a normal cervical smear. So we've got these large flat angular cells. These are squamous cells. Uh, squamous meaning scaly. Uh, so we've got a very tiny nucleus, very large cytoplasm, variable levels of either a reddish, yellowish or greenish tinge to them, which indicates uh, the ke uh, keratin content, which you'd expect in surface layer cervical cells, just like skin. Uh, within there, we've also got uh, sm very small lymphocytes. We can completely ignore these because they'll be present in normal and cancerous tissue. So this is what we're hoping to see on a normal cervical smear. This is a precancerous lesion, and you can see a completely normal cell there. We can see a slightly abnormal cell there. Note the nucleus is a bit larger and a bit irregular. And then these cells here have got a large nucleus compared to a very small cytoplasm. And this is a characteristic change that goes on in uh, early stages of transformation from normal to cancer. So this would be a uh, intraepithelial lesion but low grade but probably affected with the uh, HPV. And there are some features on there that would be visible to a trained cytologist that would suggest HPV, such as the clearing of the cytoplasm around the nucleus. This is a characteristic sign of a HPV infected cell. On this side, we've got a very high grade uh, cytology prep. Now it's query cancer because we can't be sure it's cancer because the definition of cancer is the cells are locally invasive and have invaded through the basement membrane. If all we are looking at is cells on the surface of the cervix we don't know what's happening deeper in the tissue but what we can see are very irregular nuclei so each individual cell looks very different from the next. Com again like this one comparatively small cytoplasm very large nucleus but a large irregular nucleus is suggestive of a much higher grade than this case. So HPV it preferentially infects the epithelial cells uh, of skin or cervix. So on the skin infecting your keratinocytes, on uh, the cervix squamous cells, normal squamous protective epithelial cells. Now these epithelial cells are protected from the underlying blood vessels by a basement membrane. And unless the cancer cells invade through the basement membrane, they can't access the blood supply, and that is metastasis, where the tumours can spread. So as long as they haven't done that, they are entirely treatable, and that there's no chance that the cancer has spread to a distant site. So once they invade across the basement membrane, they are defined as invasive cancer, and this particular cancer type metastasizes very freely to lim local lymph nodes and distant sites. So once they start to spread, they become pretty much untreatable. So if the infected cells remain on this outer side of the basement membrane, they are a cervical intraepithelial neoplasia, which is a benign lesion. If they cross the membrane, it's by definition invasive cancer. And the CINs are very treatable by local cryotherapy, laser ablation, or local surgery if necessary. So this is a bit of a mechanism of the HPV infection. 
So these are infectious particles. This is the basal cells. This is the basement membrane. This is the uh, dermis. This is underneath the basement membrane. All the connective tissue is down here along with blood vessels. So these are the squamous cells. You've got a proliferative layer here, this mid zone and superficial zone. And these are the cells that they get scraped off in a cervical smear. An infectious virus particle can infect a basal cell, which can give rise to all of these other cells. So in pale blue, you've got your normal nuclei, non-infected. In purple nuclei, you've got nuclei with episomal viral DNA. And this is the episomal DNA. This is a circular DNA genome that gets into the cytoplasm. And then the cell's replication machinery can transcribe those genes and copy those genes to make more viral proteins and more viral genome, which then can bud off and infect other cells. So this is a normal life cycle of virus budding off infected new cells. Now, what happens is a complete accidental genetic integration of this genome into the host genome. Now, this is not a retrovirus, it's a DNA virus, so it should never do this. But occasionally, the genome breaks open, so this is linear DNA. It gets into the nucleus and then integrates into the host human DNA, typically at the E2 gene site. These are just viral genes, early and late for E and L. So it integrates here into the host chromosome somewhere. The E6, E7 gene is always expressed. We'll find out why in a moment. Uh, E2 is often disrupted. We'll find out why in a moment. And this will drive uh, tumor genesis. So this is the situation where the virus is actually oncogenic. Whilst it's episomal, it tends not to be. So, so just to explain what's going on on this one, we have the HPV E6 oncogene inactivates the P53 gene. So this affects cell cycle and DNA repair processes. The E7 oncogene in, inactivates PRB. So this is um, controlling cells going into G1 of the, uh, from G1 to S phase of the cell cycle. So if we lose P53 and PRB, these are classic changes that occur in cancer. And the virus is able to basically get rid of these two proteins to promote cell proliferation and uh, prevent apoptosis program cell death. Now the E2 gene acts as a negative regulator of both E6 and E7. So if the viral uh, genome breaks within the E2 gene, we get excessive amounts of E6 and E7 produced and further down regulating P53 and PRB. And that is what makes those strains uh, 16 and 18 in particular very oncogenic because they very efficiently do this process. Now, once the DNA is integrated into the host genome, it is permanently there like a permanent genetic defect in those cells. Whilst ever it's episomal, in theory, the immune system could sort it out. You could get resolving of the, um, res resolving of the infection. But once it's integrated into the host cells, it's permanently there. So what we want to do is find out which types of infections are likely to go on and develop cancer. So a CIN1 is unlikely to undergo transformation into cancer in the next few years. So maybe these shouldn't be treated, but maybe if we look out for CIN3s, those are the ones that are going to go into cancer. And then we can ablate these cells with laser based treatments. Now at the moment, any abnormal cells would be ablated, whether or not they're going to go on and form cancer. Well, there'd be no point in a oncology clinic ablating very low grade lesions if they're never going to go on and develop into cancer. Maybe a GUM clinic would do that, but it's not a cancer issue. So the whole point of hybrid capture is trying to decide which viral infected cervicals, uh, cervixes, I suppose, are likely to go on and develop cancer. If they are, if they're high grade and they've got high risk HPV, treat those cases, but not necessarily treat these and maybe allow these to resolve. 
themselves or just bring these patients back for screening at a later date.